All right, church history, lesson number 24. We had uh, begun to consider the development of monasticism. And I remember when I first took church history, I, I had actually started to take a church history class in Bible college, but uh, the, the book was so liberal and the teacher was so liberal, I just couldn't hack it. And so I, I dropped the class, one of the only classes I, I ever dropped in college, actually. But um, thankfully, once I got to seminary, uh, a few things changed. I had a very, very, very good uh, church history professor. And yet, uh, despite all that, uh, the reality is that uh, I was raised in a very conservative, fundamentalist, Baptist, independent fundamentalist Baptist uh, background. And uh, it was very difficult for me, and it may be very difficult for most of you, um, to even invest effort or time to think about any forms of monasticism. The problem is that if you take that perspective, pretty much anything from the third and fourth century up through the Reformation is going to become disjointed and disconnected and difficult for you to understand because so much of what happens <coughs> Uh, especially during the medieval period, is the result of monastic impulses, Reformation impulses. And all the reformers were, were you know, uh, Luther was an Augustinian monk. And it's hard to understand Luther's table talk, for example, if you don't have some idea of what the monastic life was like, because um, he makes reference to it all the time. And so many of the reformers came out of one of the monastic movements, or when the counter-reformation begins to happen, and there was a, a counter-reformation, primarily led by the Jesuits, but uh, many of the monastic movements uh, had an impulse to defend the church. And so it's really hard to understand uh, a lot of what happened. Uh, most of the major writers were involved in some monastic order for nearly a thousand years, over a thousand years. And so it's, it's a prejudice on our part that we have to get over. Um, and we can recognize and, and should recognize uh, from the start, that there is a fundamentally unbiblical uh, impulse in separating oneself from the world in the sense of going and living in a tree somewhere. And you might say, well, that's silly. No, there were people who lived in trees. There, the, the, we'll talk about the pillar saints here in a moment. There, uh, what, is, what is a monastery? Uh, but a walled off place where you can pretend to be super spiritual. Now, don't, don't, don't you know, people are going to hear that and go, oh, you're just such a terrible, horrible person. It depends on how you de define spirituality. Um, I am not questioning, I mean, there, there are people who gave their lives, um, dedicated themselves. I mean, I, it's pretty tough to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and pray. Uh, and then again at 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, and to fast and to do all these things. And there were people who very sincerely thought this was the way to true and great spirituality. And it's real easy to just dismiss them and then go on your way and, and uh, spend the entire morning service thinking about uh, the Dallas uh, Green Bay game coming up, you know, real easy to do. Uh, but it is not a balanced biblical impulse to see the church as being removed from the world. And we need to understand, well, why... What would have started this? Because the, the apostles didn't start any type of monastic movement. Uh, 
there's no evidence whatsoever that any of the original churches that they founded had any idea of, uh, well, priests uh, or monks or a monastic life or anything like that. So what happens? And a lot of the later monastic movement is related to sacralism. <laughs> sacralism. And this is going to come up a number of times, uh, especially when we um, get, pat, get up to the Council of Nicaea where this really starts. It starts in a small way and grows over time. Once you have a state church, once under Theodosius in about 380, uh, Rome becomes officially, the Roman Empire becomes officially a Christian empire. Uh, for the next, well, all the way through the Reformation, because one of the big questions, one of the big issues that we'll be dealing with at the time of the Reformation is how did someone like a Luther go from standing before Charles V with his life hanging in the balance in 1521, uh, pleading for the right to follow his conscience, to four years later in Wittenberg, allowing the death penalty to be used against Anabaptists. How does that work? Um, it's real easy for us to do the hero worship thing on a surface level. And then when we really start thinking about the complexities of what was going on, eh, it doesn't work real well. How did that happen? Well, it was, how, how was it that Zwingli, uh, meeting with the earliest scholarly Anabaptists, Balthazar Hubmeier and, 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 other, and other people in that time period, how could Zwingli and Hubmeier, how could Zwingli recognize the necessity of sola scriptura, reject so many of Rome's uh, practices based upon applying sola scriptura, and yet when it came to infant baptism, he for a while recognized there, really, there wasn't a biblical basis. But under pressure from the church council in Zurich, he accepts eventually the death penalty for Anabaptists. I've stood on the bridge in Zurich where many Anabaptists were given what's called their third baptism. Uh, infant baptism, the baptism they received as an Anabaptist, and then drowned by the state. And how, how does that happen fairly quickly? Um, it's sacralism. The, the world in which the reformers lived had for a thousand years been a world where if you were the citizen of the state, you were a member of the church. They were identical things. And what's most important to recognize is by the days of the Reformation, the baptismal records of the church were the basis of the tax rolls of the state. So you stop baptizing infants, and the state does not like this, because the state likes its taxes, and uh, likes order, and likes unanimity. And religion was seen, religion starts becoming seen, well, I'll take this back. Religion was seen as holding the Roman Empire together under the Caesars. What did you have to do? Remember, what, what, what caused the persecution? You had to offer the pinch of incense upon the altar and say what? Kaiser Kurios, Caesar is Lord. Now, they didn't care if you worshipped other gods. But what brought that unity was that was the, the, the society as a whole had that commitment that gave unity and so Rome was, Rome practiced sacralism. And so once Theodosius makes the Roman Empire Christian, then you have this massive influx of people to Christianity who've never heard the gospel. 
so you have this, what, what eventually, and, and this is a major problem today in many places, you have nominalism. Nama, not the, the, the concept being in name only. In name only. So you have all sorts of quote unquote Christian countries uh, that have become extremely secular uh, over just the past couple of decades uh, because they were nominally Christian to begin with. Uh, Italy, a huge example of this, obviously. Um, many of the Muslim nations are nominally Muslim. The people may say the prayers, but there's no practice, so on and so forth. It's just in name only. And so nominalism becomes the, the watchword because there's, you know, you could, I suppose if you have some certain eschatological views, you might argue with me about this, but I see no evidence in scripture that it's the intention of the New Testament church to be the state. Um, and so once that happens, uh, things are going to change. And the later monastic impulses often come from the fact that people look around at the church and they go, where is the fervor? Where is the faith? Where is the life? Where is the spirituality? It's just, it's dead. It's formalism. It's just what people do because they're a part of this culture. It's just, it's just routines and so on and so forth. And so someone will break away and they'll have you know, this tremendous idea of discipline and prayer and fervor and zeal and so on and so forth. And it'll start a new monastic movement. And all the major monastic orders, that's how they started. And you'd frequently have reformations going on within them. Because over time, people would donate to those orders and, and they'd start getting involved with worldly stuff and the fervor would cool, the zeal would cool, and then there'd be another one, and then there'd be another one. This is the history of, of the medieval period. And a lot of it's related to this idea of sacralism. And then when we get into Calvin, um, we all know that the most devastating argument against the biblical doctrine of predestination election is to scream, Servetus! <clears throat> how many of you know what I just, how many of you know why I just said that? How many of you don't know why I just said that? Okay. So you don't know who Miguel Servetus is. You, ha you have not been doing enough arguing with Arminians on Facebook. <laughs> all I need to do is assign to all of you, find an Arminian on Facebook and argue with them, and you'll discover who Servetus was. Miguel Servetus uh, is uh, put to death uh, by the city of Geneva uh, for his, well, it wasn't specifically for his denial of predestination election. Uh, he was actually an anti-Trinitarian heretic. We'll, we'll get into it. But um, the big argument that is made against Calvin, Calvin could not possibly have been a Christian because Calvin killed Servetus. Well, Calvin didn't kill Servetus, but Calvin was involved in the prosecution of Servetus as a heretic, and Servetus was burned at the stake. Now, of course, Rome was torching folks right and left, in fact, had tried to burn Servetus, but he had escaped the night before his burning uh, in his night clothes by jumping up on the top of the toilet and jumping over the fence. Um, so Rome was, Rome was torturing people right and left, but since this was a non-Roman Catholic state, uh, the Lutherans had been doing it. They had been doing it in the Swiss cantons. It, it, it's not like it was the first time it had happened. But it happened that one time. That name has become extremely famous because he was extremely intelligent. He, he's credited as the first person to discover in the West the circulatory system, the blood system of the body. So he was, he was a brilliant medical doctor as well as a theological nutcase. Uh, sometimes those two go together, sometimes they don't. But anyway... Uh, we have to end up dealing with this, and it all goes back to sacralism, because Luther, uh, uh, Calvin is a second generation reformer, and for the past basically 1,200 years, the experience 
of everyone has been the sacral state, this, the church state union. And when we start talking about the rise of the papacy and we start talking about especially the struggle for supremacy uh, in the, from the turn of the millennium through about the 1300s between church and state where kings and popes are battling it out and normally the popes are winning, but not always. Um, it all goes back to this relationship between church and state and where it starts. And the monastic movements after Nicaea, very much related to that. A rebellion against the nominalism and the deadness and the, it just becomes regular. And this is important to us today. You, you look at Europe and you look at what has happened to Europe and the speed with which it has happened. Now World War II had a lot to do with that. Had a lot to do with that. But there was obviously no foundation, even that society at that time, to be able to survive the horrors of World War II. And now you see the result, this, this rejection of, of everything that was its history. And we see the, the dead state churches in those nations, and they are dead. There is not a, an orthodox living state church in Europe. If it's the state church, it's the dead church. Did you all see the, uh, the video this week of the Episcopalians in Glasgow, Scotland, who had the nice Mormon lady in to sing Tajweed from the Quran? And she, she uh, did the recitation from Surah 19, Surah Mariam, uh, that specifically denies the deity of Christ and the Trinity. And there, there's all the Episcopalians sitting there in all their long flowing robes in the cathedral in Glasgow with a Muslim chanting Tajweed from the Quran, denying the central aspects of the Christian faith. Well, it's not a central aspect of the Christian faith, those men anymore. It, it's dead. It's, it's dead formalism. Uh, it, just, it just exists as a shell. And um, if we don't see what led to all of that, uh, then we're never going to really be able to place it in history. And some of the weirdest, strangest interpretations you get of history uh, are from people who don't realize that what's going on today hmm, has something to do with what happened yesterday and in the years and generations and centuries before. So, but all of that wide arc of discussion there uh, to get us back to the fact that monasticism has its origins in a time when the church was under persecution. Not a time of nominalism. Now, there were periods of nominalism briefly in that time period when, pers when persecution would, would wane. Um, and we will uh, talk a little bit about, um, hmm, where do I get to that? Uh, somewhere, did we, we haven't talked about um, the Montanists, did we? A little bit when you talked about Tertullian a bit. Okay, I did talk about a little bit about, uh, yeah, okay, I think that's the only, I, I think it is the only time. To, well, remember Montanism, sorry about that. Uh, Montanism was a Reformation movement, a spiritualizing movement that grew out of someone feeling like the church of his day just wasn't fervent enough in its, in its zeal. And that's gonna happen a lot down through, down through history. Uh, it, it, if you don't recognize the cycle then you'll, you'll see it in your own lifetime if you actually look around, but especially if you have the eyes of, of, of history. So when we talk about the rise of monasticism, it begins with the hermits. The hermits, or they're also known as the anchorites. And this pretty much uh, starts in, uh, in Egypt. They're also called the Desert Fathers the Desert Fathers, and I mentioned to you uh, Anthony, uh, who lived for 106 years, so maybe monasticism, fasting once in a while is actually good for you, you know, it's just to live 106 years, um, 250 to 356, uh, Anthony lived on an island in the middle of the Nile, and uh, that, you know, would be a fairly small world to live in. But from, the, see, from their perspective, not traveling 
and limiting yourself. That was part of the bodily discipline. To live in a cave, uh, or as we're talking about here, to the pillar saints, that's part of, of the, the bodily discipline. And since he lived in one place, then he would have disciples that would come and they would begin to ask of him spiritual insight. And as the number of these people grew, obviously their authority within the church would become, um, well, eventually troubling uh, to bishops and to people in official ecclesiastical authority because they very rarely held church office but they wielded spiritual power. And as we saw when Cyprian, for example, had to return to Carthage, why? Because the confessors, people who had suffered, were messing around with areas that weren't supposed to be part of their area of authority. Um, I mentioned uh, that these individuals would not for example, someone would not lay down, accept any bodily comfort, wouldn't use pillows or blankets, wouldn't bathe. Um, all of this really going back to a, a Gnostic idea of the body being bad, the spirit being good. So this is sort of the spirit demonstrating that you can allow the body to decay and putrefy, basically, and that's not affecting you because the real you is the spirit and so on and so forth. And that there is a, you know, that, that's not a biblical concept. But it became, it became popular. And I mentioned last week, for those of you who missed this wonderful visual uh, for you to, to, to remember, that some of the uh, saints would demonstrate their uh, authority over their bodies by allowing bugs to crawl through their teeth and that this would not bother them. They would, they would be talking to you about your spirituality while bugs are crawling through their teeth. And uh, this was an illustration. George, you're really looking at me like we need a waste paper basket quick. Uh, um, yeah. That, that. The Grinch comes to mind. Yes, yes, yes. Um, then you had the pillar saints. The pillar saints. And since... I, you know, I'm not trying to make fun of this guy, but I used, a, I used a Latin phrase on the dividing line last week, I think. Uh, it's the Latin phrase, satis passio, satis passio. It means self-suffering. It's the suffering you undergo in purgatory. And uh, this guy on Twitter contacts me and says, I'm trying to find what you said to look up. I've Googled for half an hour. And then when he spelled what he thought I had said, it was so far off that I said, oh, that's why I have to write stuff on the board. OK, all right, I get it. Um, the, uh, the pillar saints, pillar saints, such as, um, Simon Stilotes, or in English, Simon the Stylite. Which does not mean he was stylish, I can assure you of that. Um, Simon lived from 390 to 459, so he's a little bit farther down. He became a hermit near Antioch while still a teenager. So imagine what this is like, a teenager. And so he's sitting on this, on a little mound. And he starts to build it up. Uh, so he, you know, he gathers some, a little more dirt and gets it a little bit higher. And, you know, and the higher he gets, the more he has to sort of compact it and things like that. And, and since that's where he lives, that's where he lays down at night, uh, it's sort of hard a little bit dangerous if you're living on a pillar to try to try to stand all the time. That would that would not work well, especially if it's windy. Um, you know, it'd be packed together, and I don't want to get too graphic, but you could provide some moisture uh, to help it hold together and things like that. And um, uh, so he started building up this pillar, and it it gets higher and higher and. Eventually what happens is, is, is people realize this, this young man has not left this place. 
Uh, and of course, if you're up on the pillar, it's sort of hard for you to be working, buying food, things like that. You have to have disciples to bring you food. And of course, they'll basically exchange the food for spiritual guidance and leadership and insight. And so he starts building this pillar up. Anyone want to guess um, how high Simon's pillar eventually was when he died? He didn't fall off, by the way. Just, well, I did, let's just say history does not record whether he ever fell off. Uh, that's not a part of my notes, anyways. Um, but uh, anyone want to guess how, how high? Six stories. Wow. Six stories. What's that, about 60 feet? About, about 60 feet. And so his disciples would come, and of course he had, had to have a rope. And he would bring food up and, I guess, let waste down. And maybe once in a while, you know, I mean, it, it can get cold even in Antioch. I suppose it might snow there about as often as it snows here. But, um, you know, something along those lines. But, but, but uh, he received visitors, disciples. Uh, and his views greatly influenced the religious views in the area. He was a force to be reckoned with uh, religiously around Antioch uh, during that uh, time period. Simon Stilotes. Um, now, where do, you, where do you get that from Scripture? I don't have a clue. Uh, but once you buy into the idea of the body-spirit separation type stuff, um, you can see where that, uh, that comes, by, comes from. Well, eventually, uh, you had the development of Cenobitic communities because being a monk by yourself is a bit of a bummer and uh, it's a little lonely, uh, discouraging, not a lot of people can do it. And he discovered that when maybe three of you were in the same cave and <clears throat> sort of worked together and encouraged one another, that was a little bit easier. And so this is really where you get the beginning uh, of the communal monks, which becomes much more the standard monastery, monastic life type situation that you would envision during the medieval period and, and uh, things like that. One of the big names uh, early on in the giving of direction to how this should be done was a fellow by the name of Pacomius, P-A-C-H-O-M-I-U-S, Pacomius, the end of the third century. And then Basil of Caesarea, uh, who we will see later on as a very important uh, person in the early Christological controversies. Uh, had a great impact on the formation of communities, which eventually led to the establishment of formal monasteries. At first, it wouldn't be, you know, a formal monastery in the sense of a building or something like that. It would just be a large cave or series of caves or something like that uh, where the individuals would get together, but eventually would lead to the founding of monasteries. Now, this also gets us into uh, another area and that is the, uh, the degradation in this early period of the view of what we would call here the external or visible church in regards to sexuality. Specifically, uh, marriage over against celibacy and uh, also a, a very unhealthy devaluation of women. Um, the idea of celibacy, it's, it's, it, you would think that people would get the idea after a time. Like I said, uh, we've had earlier movements that began that emphasized uh, celibacy, and they died out. Uh, this is the natural way of things. Um, you, you don't have kids to pass your views on to. Generally, don't last long periods of time. And yet, uh, we know in 
primarily in Western, in the Western areas, because Eastern Christianity uh, continues to have married uh, priests uh, to this day. But you had the development of a celibate clergy. Now, again, this is, this is development. This takes place over time. It doesn't happen one night. It doesn't happen one day. It doesn't happen in one year. Um, there, there's a lot of, of things that have to come together to form what we have today in what Rome calls not a dogma, but a discipline. Uh, Rome would say that there are dogmatic foundations for her denial of marriage to her priests, but would uh, insist that it is a discipline and not a dogma. Dogma being something you have to believe, a discipline being something that is best to do for the highest level of spirituality. By the middle of the second century, the interactions of church with the surrounding cultures of the day resulted in a view that indicated that celibacy was a road to a more spiritual life because celibacy became equated with spiritual power. Your ability to rein in and to control the lusts of the flesh. But quickly the problem of sexual scandal arose and had to be addressed at the council of, I love this, this is one of my favorite early church councils in 306, the council, you ready for this, of Elvira. And half of you are going, Elvira. Yep. 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 Oh, Oak Ridge Boys. El yep. <laughs> yeah, I don't think there is any connection between, it was Oak Ridge Boys, between the Oak Ridge Boys and the, this particular Elvira. But, well, um, they're kind of old enough. They might have been. No, no, no. They're not that old. They're not, uh, uh, this is 306, not uh, 1906. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, the Council of Elvira and Nicaea had to address uh, these issues as well. Uh, as, soon as, as soon as celibacy becomes the thing, there are going to be people who claim it, but aren't it. <laughs> and that's just, it's going to become so common uh, that by the time of the Reformation, uh, it is, it's, it's an accepted thing. You can be a, a celibate priest with a concubine and kids. And it's just, it's been that way for so long that it's like, eh, you know, whatever. By the end of the 4th century, priestly celibacy began to be enforced in some, but not all, areas. The Eastern churches never adopted the requirement, and while the West did, the working relationships between priests and women for the next 1,000 years after the Reformation and beyond involved sexual activity. And so, uh, one of the biggest names at the time of the Reformation is, of course, Desiderius Erasmus. And Erasmus was the illegitimate son of a priest. And for him to become a priest himself, he had to get a special dispensation from the church because of that uh, parental problem uh, that, was, that was his. But no one considered it any major league big deal because there were just so many that it was recognized that that's just the way things were. And it was, it was recognized... <laughs> maybe not, maybe whispered a little bit more than talked about openly, but uh, especially after the period called the pornocracy in the 10th century, uh, everybody knew that the Bishop of Rome had multiple women, multiple concubines, and that the Vatican was a debauched place. Um, it was well known. Um, part of the push for celibacy had to do with the declining view of women again due to the easily observed departure from biblical backgrounds and standards. While in the New Testament we find women as co-workers with the apostles and even in Acts uh, being called prophetesses in a couple of places. And while we find a high view of marriage in the New Testament, even to the point of likening Christ's relationship to the church, to marriage, these views were eventually allegorized away. And what allowed you to do that? Origin. Origin and the allegorical methodology, if there's something that doesn't fit your theology, you just allegorize it away. Um, and replace with a viewpoint that saw the physical, now you wonder who came up with this, that saw the physical attractiveness of women 
as a temptation to sin, and hence it was of the devil. Um, this becomes, uh, this is, when we get to Jerome, well, I, 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 actually, that's the next illustration, so we'll do that in a second. Celibacy becomes the ideal, and marriage becomes an impediment to the higher life. And so if you're a, a married man with children, it is just given that you have settled for a secondary spirituality. A secondary spirituality. And again, what does this illustrate? It illustrates a, a moving away from um, the scriptures as the, well, sola scriptura and tota scriptura and illustrates what happens when philosophy, forms of philosophy, the views of society uh, end up determining how you read the scriptures that are there. As an example, Jerome and Paula. That's two, that's three words. Jerome, the great biblical scholar, and Paula. Now, uh, this is 347 to 419, I think, are the years for Jerome. And we'll be looking at Jerome more later on because he had a huge impact in, well, he's going to translate the Latin Vulgate, which becomes the text of the Western Church, all the way up through the Reformation, and even to the point where uh, the King James translators uh, it can fairly be said, were far more comfortable with Latin than they were with Greek. And even the advertisements uh, in, the, in the beginning of the 17th century, even advertisements for uh, the Greek New Testament would be printed in Latin. Hmm. Uh, so Jerome's work just absolutely, massively important. But in regards to this subject, Paula entered the monastic life, so there was already a, a female monasticism at this point in time, entered the monastic life under the influence of Jerome after becoming a widow. So she had been married, her husband died, she becomes a widow. So under the influence of Jerome, she enters the monastic life. She had had five children, one rather young, that she left to others to care for making a pilgrimage to Palestine where she visited the recently rediscovered cross. Hmm. So there's the, the rise in the fourth century of what will eventually become the trade and relics and things like that. The stone to the tomb and the manger. So here in the fourth century already, you know, these things are, well, hey, you go over there today, they'll show you the same things. <laughs> in multiple places. <laughs> uh, she then went to Egypt and prostrated herself before the Desert Fathers. She returned to Bethlehem and founded there a monastery for Jerome where she was abbess until 404 AD. She was tremendously generous, giving away all her personal funds and ending up indebting her daughter to a tremendous degree by the time of her death, having borrowed money at high rates of interest just to give it away. Paul became an example of the perfect nun, and many followed in her footsteps. Physically attractive, she did everything she could to hide and deface her beauty. She said, quote, I must disfigure my face, which I have often against the command of God, adorned with paint. Torment the body, which has participated in many idolatries, and atone for long laughing by constant weeping, end quote. She felt it was her duty to be as non-woman as possible so as to not cause men to stumble. So, it is, I think, important to recognize the impact that this type of development has for a long, 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 long time. I mean, it, it really is. Uh, it, most 
secular historians are not going to bring this out for other reasons, but the beginning of the women's movement and not the negative aspects of the women's movement, but the positive aspects of the women's movement is found in the Reformation. It is the Reformation that recovers a, a biblical view of marriage as the picture of the relationship of Christ to the church. It's the Reformation. Um, you know, who did Luther marry? Uh, Catherine von Bora was a former nun that escaped from the monastery in a pickle barrel. Um, and very early, Luther began preaching against these unbiblical vows. And uh, we will see Catherine, or Katie, his dear Katie, uh, was absolutely central to, to Luther's survival, who had deep bouts, deep bouts of depression. And um, it was only Katie who got, her, got him through those things. It's so long till we get to Luther, I'll go ahead and tell his story now, because you won't remember it by the time we get there. But um, once Luther was in the basement in the dark, just in the, in the deep throes of depression, and Katie comes down, and she's wearing clothes of mourning, and she sits down weeping with Luther. And Luther looks at her and goes, What's wrong with you? What happened? She says, oh, God is dead. He says, you foolish woman. God can't die. And she looks at him and says, then what are you doing? And he's like, you know, it's like, stop ruining my foul mood, you know, uh, <laughs> by reminding me of truths that I already know, you know, that, that kind of thing. And so, um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, it's, it's really the Reformation. So you're talking, when, when people want to attack, see, this is, this is where you, you have to be able to define what Christianity is. You need to understand, for the vast majority of the world, Rome is Christianity. And so Rome's history is Christian history. And therefore, there was a lengthy period of time where in opposition to biblical truth, women were devalued. And so the women's studies programs all over the place are going to just hammer away on that. And there's, you, you can't deny it. It's true. But you also have to say it's true because it was unbiblical. They weren't practicing sola scriptura and tota scriptura. And when you do, you get a balanced view that would not include these things. Uh, but don't get, don't get, don't fall for the temptation to deny what the reality was just simply because, well, it looks bad. No, it, it was bad. But why was it bad? And why shouldn't it have happened? And what are we doing today uh, that demonstrates we recognize why that was bad, why it was wrong, uh, and that we're not going to do the same thing today because of the source of authority that we have. That's why we do exegesis. That's why we do the things that we do in regards to handling the word of God. So uh, Paula, Jerome, not a good thing. Not, not a good thing at all. Hate to stop at that point, but the next, the next part in our outline, Mary, the ideal woman. Mm. Mary, the ideal woman. The rise of Mariolatry. That'll be the next topic, but... I'm not here for a while, so we'll, uh, we'll, it'll be a little while until we, we get to that one. Let's uh, close the word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for this time, and we do ask, uh, especially in light of what we have studied today, that once again uh, we would be focused upon your word as our source of truth, balanced handling of it, a recognition of its supremacy. May that even mark what we do as we go into worship you now and open your word in the service. May you be honored and glorified in all things. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.